Let me go find that. Uh, That's the last bus? Okay. All right, I'll go fast. So at 525, anybody who has to get that bus, um, stand up and take off, because we don't want you to miss the bus. And I don't um, want to stop talking. We don't have enough cars to get you <laughs> up there. And Sylvia, wait till you see, she'll have half an hour of presentation, and she's going to have like 100 slides to go through. I'm at 43, uh, I think. I don't know. Okay. So I wanted to, um, oh, here. I wanted to cover that whole issue about units in open seas. So open seas is dimensionless. Everything that goes in has, comes out the same way. So make sure everything is all in inches, if that's what you want, or all in kips and all the different units. The way I get around it for my input is I just play with the whole variables concept. So I define, if I want my basic units to be inches, then I say set inches equal to one, okay? And then I say feet equals to 12 times inches, okay? I like to keep it that way. It could just be 12 because it's really the factor. This is going to evaluate feet is going to say 12 times 1, okay? So when I define the column width, to be equal to six, three feet and six inches, is going to take three times the value of feet, which is 12, plus six times the value of inches, which is one, and that's going to give me the answer in inches. What's nice is I can go and swap the inches and feet if I want all my input to be in feet rather than inches, oftentimes metric or non-metric. I don't have to change the value of each column. Okay, because I've defined it as that, it, but then feet would be equal to 1 and inches would be equal to 112. Does that make sense? So what I've done, and you'll see this in what they now call the advanced examples manual, I've built a library of units. Okay, so my basic units, and I like to say, I like to define them at the very beginning so that I can always go back. And this is a little file that I use and I just take it with me with all of my, exam all of my examples or all of my problems, okay? So inches, kips, and seconds are my basic units, okay? The text that I define, I assign to those is I use it in some other places. I say, okay, times the length units and it gives you that, okay? Uh, feet, KSI, you can even define things in centimeters. You can even define centimeters if you want. I like to define pi and I like to define G, okay? Because what's really cool about defining G in your input variables mm -hmm. is when you then work on your input file, you say, okay, source libunits.tickle, okay? I always call lib my library files. And then I say, okay, set my column height to be 36 feet. I don't care whether I'm in feet or inches, okay? My weight is 2,000 kips. My column dimensions are, you know, feet, I can even say plus two inches, two centimeters if I want. And it's automatically going to calculate what those variables are. Does that make sense? Yay? Nay? If anybody uses MathCAD, that's kind of where I picked it up from. Okay? Um, what I really, really like about doing it this way and defining G is oftentimes a lot of people get really confused when they're defining nodal masses. Okay, converting from kips, kip force to kip mass. Okay, if you define your G ahead of time, you can just define your weight, you know, it's 2,000 kips, then the mass, you know, or then the force on that node is going to be the weight. This is a cantilever. Then the mass, you just define it as the weight divided by G, and you move on with your life. I don't have to figure out what the units were and how to convert from kips to feet to get forced to keep mass. Does that make sense? Okay, if you look at the examples, this is how you can tell if examples are my examples in the manual or not. I really tried to put this in from the very beginning and carry it through. Okay? Questions on units? Because I'm gonna move on to my stuff. Okay, so the I'm gonna talk about a user interface that we developed when I was at uh, working on Open Seas many years ago and we kind of started off as a as just a demonstration project and it kind of turned into a pretty neat uh, tool that you can use for analysis and it's on the Nice Hub 
if you want to run it, just like you went to OpenSea's lab, you can go to Build and Tickle. Okay? What we wanted to do is let's develop an interface, a user interface that has some graphics and has scripts um, for OpenSea. So you can visualize your model. But what I really wanted to do was I didn't want to have to do the bookkeeping of what is the format for the uniaxial material? What is the format for Concrete 2 uh, What are my known numbers? What are my element numbers? And things like that. We really didn't want to put that into the user interface. What we wanted to do is, you've got these drawings. You've got elevations. You've got plans. Let's do the interface as if you're reading me the story or describing uh, your model in such a way. But also be consistent with open seas. Also, graphical user interfaces are very powerful, yes? Scripting user interfaces are that much more powerful. When people tell you OpenSeas does not have a user interface, they're wrong because the script of Tickle and the being able to program in Tickle is so much better than anything that you can do with a graphical interface. But the graphical is kind of cool because you can actually see whether you made some mistakes or not. Okay? So what we wanted to do is develop something that could do both. So we added on just a bunch of commands on top of the OpenSeas commands, the Tickle commands. I literally just defined thousands of procs, Tickle procedures, that you just called, uh, just like Frank showed you a procedure before. Okay, just new commands, just defining these procedures. In MATLAB, you can define functions, right? So same kind of concept. Um, so really, this is where we started from, okay? You've got elevations and you've got plans. Typically in elevations, you can see the beams and the columns, and the plan, you see the plan dimensions. So the way you would define a model is first you will build a library of materials and elements, or materials and sections, and I'll show you that. But then when you're really trying to build, put the model together, what you define is a bunch of elevations, you define a grid, a plan pretty much, and then to build the 3D model, you just take these grids or elevations and just place them in your plan as you decide that they belong. Okay, so here's an example of the very top one is how you would define an elevation. You define a geometry of just height and width for each bay. You define columns and beams and different elements, boundary conditions, and then gravity load. Pretty straightforward. You look at that, you can understand what that element, what that um, elevation looks like by even just reading it. It's a really nice way of checking it and it's pretty clean. It takes advantage of anything tickle, so you can make any part of that programmable. Okay, I just added this model command called add model data, and it does have certain input. And that's when the GUI kind of is handy because it will help you a little bit better with the input for it. Uh, the plans are pretty straightforward. You define plans. You can even give names to the different grid lines, and then you literally, when you put together this 3D frame, you just say, okay, I've got this is my plan. And this is where I want the elevations to be put into your model. So there's your 3D model put together. You don't have to define nodes. You don't have to define um, nodal masses. You don't have to define, you know, go back to the open seas manual and figure out, okay, what is the format for the truss element versus the truss section element. Um, if you go back, as I told you, you build it, you know, pretty much follow, it has to follow open seas because this uses open seas. Um, you do the same thing, you build a library, just so you like you build a library of elements, uh, excuse me, a, a library of elevations, you go back and you build a library of materials, you can build a library of sections. What's really cool with the scripting is you take these with you and you can use them again in other models. Okay? Uh, well, you never have one single model, you've got these different eccentricity cases and things like that. So it's really nice to have a nice clean library with you. Um, for example, for concrete material, you just say, and I've built a bunch of templates, okay, to confine concrete material. I've decided what the residual stress is and factors that uh, the concrete O2 asks for. All you as a user have to say, okay, it's a 4,000 PSI concrete. Everything else, I define it for you. It's actually optional variable, so you can actually put those numbers in if you want to. Okay, so you can have maximum control or even minimal control. Um, a section, you know, if you guys look at this, it's pretty straightforward. It's kind of an easy to understand what this section looks like, okay? And even when you define element types, you know, with open seas, you can have displacement-based elements, you can have force-based elements, distributed plasticity, low plasticity. So it's all pretty straightforward and put together here. You don't have to think about the open seas format. I have thousands of lines of code that interpret 
what you're doing here. Same thing with analysis models. I mean, a lot of you have that little script that you copied over from Frank, and I have no idea what it <laughs> says. <laughs> okay, actually with Tom, even I've learned what most of those things are. Well, I took care of all that for you. Frank and I went through iterations of, okay, what is the best algorithm for this kind of analysis? For static analysis, for gravity analysis, a pushover analysis, and a dynamic time history analysis. I've even put in the script, as Frank was telling you, about you know helping it to converge. And I put in the script in there so that you don't have to worry about it. And it works for 90% of the cases. Most of the time, if the model doesn't converge, it's the model. There's something just not right in the model. If OpenSeas crashes on you, mm -hmm. it means that you've connected an element to two nodes, and probably one of those two nodes you have not defined. And the people that designed OpenSeas never thought that somebody would assign a, not assign a node that it was going to use. Okay? So you got to really be careful. So this going through this process really helps to cut down a lot of uh, oh, did I forget to define this, or did I not forget to decide, decide that? Um, you can define lateral loads, uh, just like what you guys just did for your static pushover analyses and for your ground motions. You define them through these kinds of commands. It's pretty straightforward now that you've got the experience, but you can see it's a much simpler format. Um, and then you can do load combinations. Right? You never do one model, one analysis. You, do, you build lots of models, and you have these different load combinations. So this is our examples of different kinds of load combinations that you define the loads ahead of time. And they say, OK, I'm going to use one that's just a gravity dead load, one that has different uh, gravity combinations. And so then when you run the analysis, you say, OK, run this element, this model with these load combinations. And you can even do unidirectional and bidirectional. Uh, load combinations. So an interesting example to just go back to the simple input, it's pretty straightforward whether you view it graphically or even looking at the script uh, that it gets a little bit more complicated but it's pretty clean anyways. Okay, so this was all really cool. In the first part it was all just a scripting. We didn't put a, a user, a graphic user interface on top. Um, but then I reached the point where we kind of had to. So now you can, there's building tickle viewer, um, which actually can actually help you to build the model. So I need to come up with a new name on it. it actually has the interface for building the model. It has a nice interface for running the open season analyses. That you can actually press analyze and select different models, different load combinations. You just click run them, and it just runs them sequentially one after the other. I have to go and put it into the parallel computing so it runs faster. But right now it's just a sequential processor. What's really nice is once you push analyze, you can actually watch the structure deform and you can watch, if it's a pushover analysis, you can watch the force deformation as it actually moves along. So you can really keep an eye, because oftentimes when you run open seas, it's just sitting there, you have no idea what's going on. Because if you make it tell you what the status is, it really slows down the analysis. So this is a nice and efficient way. I only check every so many time steps on what the status is. Here's an example of the input for the material. I have a large library of materials. And as you can see, all you have to find is 4,000 PSI for the concrete strength. But if you're familiar with the concrete O2, there's a whole bunch of additional parameters that you can control. I put in some default values, but if you want, you can, you can modify those. What's really nice about being able to run this, the difference between Running this all, in, this is Tickle and TK, which is the graphical interface of Tickle, is I can actually run open seas. It's not a pre and post processor. I can actually push the button and I say, okay, run an open seas analysis. And so I can actually do this with the material. Say, so, okay, test the material and it shows you what the hysteretic response of the material is. You could do the same thing with a section. I've got a library of different sections. You can define all the different properties associated with that section. You say, okay, test the moment curvature response of this section under a specified gravity load. And you can actually watch it as the trace moves. So sometimes if it's a badly designed section, you see it that it's having problems converging or it's decreasing in strength. So the nice thing about doing a user interface using Tickle TK versus MATLAB is that you can run OpenSeas real time. Okay, you're not pre and post processing it. 
something I find really cool, and we can spend full hours on it, is how you define the elevations. Okay, it's a pretty efficient way of defining elevations. Just as it was pretty efficient in defining in the script, it's a nice way of defining them also in the graphical user interface. <coughs> My phone has trouble. Is that my phone? Yeah. Oh. Okay. It's my kid and the doctor. <laughs> um, but here's an example when you define the elevation. I've defined a number of grids, and then I select, okay, what kind of section do I want? Additional parameters if needed, and then you literally just click on your grid and say, okay, assign that section here, assign it here, or assign it here. So it's nice, you know, click not where the nodes are, defining the nodes and this and that. You literally just define where the elements and you just place it where you want in the elevation. You then can do something, so it's nice, we can spend a lot of time, you literally can real time modify these dimensions here and just go on there and change the numbers. Um, you can define your grid and then what's really cool in the 3D model, you select the grid and then you pick elevations and you can put it here and the 3D graphic shows you where that elevation ends up. So you could build something like this pretty quickly um, and relatively simple. It's almost simpler to build something this big. As I was telling you before, you literally select different models, different load combinations, say, okay, analyze. And you can watch it, and uh, this is just a screenshot. As it's, you can watch the time history, and you can watch the deformed shape. Uh, you can even run bidirectional. You can actually push the button and say, okay, stop the analysis. And you can actually stop the analysis in, in open seas and then keep going if you want to. Um, it's really nice for visualizing results, which is a, a much bigger issue uh, than pre -pro Anybody can write a script, but it's really hard to interpret the data, especially visually. So you can actually pick a model that you run and the mode combination. Then you can actually watch it, visualize it, in post-processing, just animate the deformation. You can watch the response history. You can click on a point in that response history and find out what the state of your structure is. Uh, there's lots of different ways that you can view it. You can click on a node and get the displacements of that node. You can do some nice color graphics to see which ones are the critical element. Uh, you can actually see if you have fiber sections, what the sections look like. Uh, you can plot bending moment diagrams, and a 3D is kind of difficult to visualize it, so I can actually do it color-coded, such as here. Uh, this is looking at the plastic hinge rotation, so you go, oh, okay, so these are my critical sections right here. You can then go in and click on that element if you want to see what that element looks like. Um, different ways of selecting what you want to visualize. You can even visualize individual ele elevations. Uh, you can do, you know, load combinations and, you know, envelope load combinations. Uh, the fun part is you can click on an element and you can look at all the force deformation response or even the fiber section response if it's a fiber section type. Um, for example, here's moment curvature response at node I and node J of this element. So it's a great way of just evaluating what the status is. So, are you selecting these recorders, or does it all... I've selected. You don't have to select recorders. I've selected all the recorders. Okay. And I, so, what if, what if there's too many, it's too much information? Well, that's why I process it for you. So, it is, right now, the way it is right now, it is too much information. No, no, I mean, I mean, what if it's too much data? Um, and you don't want all those recorders? You know, I need to figure out a way of minimizing okay. recorders. Right now, I mean, I just swept through, and I haven't really had that many users to really get that kind of feedback. Um, right now, I only have element and node recorders. I don't have any fiber section recorders, even though, because those are the what takes time. Mm -hmm. Even though I magically can tell you what is going on at a fiber in your section, in your analysis. So here's we picked an element. I want to look at the fiber section response. I've got selected locations, and you can actually see, okay, what that steel fiber is doing there, or the concrete, actually this is yeah, this concrete fiber at that location. So you can get fiber strain, stresses and strains at the element at the section level. But those are not um, recorded during your analysis. So really optimize the type of output that you get. 
Um, so that's pretty much just an overview. It's on uh, the, uh, my next step is to do a better job with wall modeling, uh, do a little bit more optimization in the post-processing because sometimes that takes a little bit of time. Um, I want to move to the high performance and distributed computing um, and install it on the cloud, even though it is on the NIS hub right now. Okay? Any questions? Is it just for structures? Well, you know, geotechnical, it depends on what you want to do with it. I have soil springs, so if you have just basic. Uh, simple PY, you know, zero length elements at the base. In my version that I'm working on right now, I do have soil springs in there. Uh, if you want to do a pile analysis, you can get around it. It's pretty easy the way I have it configured to add that feature onto it. Because all this does is it's an interp it interprets this input and mm -hmm. then converts it into an open C. So if it can be done in open C, just the key is trying to design the user interface for it. But yeah, that's my plan, is to be able to do some pile modeling. Um, but right now, shallow foundation, you just put zero length springs at the base and you can do it. Which is what we did with Tim a long time ago. Is this available? <laughs> huh? Is this available? It's on the Nice Hub. I've updated it since the version that's on the Nice Hub. Uh, so if you're interested in using it, you got to talk to me. I'm trying to figure out where to put it, whether to put it on the Nice Hub or um, put it on the big, uh, what's out there. It's probably gonna end up on the knees hub. I haven't worked on, I just, I haven't worked on this in about three to four years officially. So I've been pretty much doing it on my own. But this is also an example of what you could do with tickle programming, honestly. I mean, that's what it was meant to do. I highly recommend using tickle and TK and learning those rather than go to MATLAB and other um, programs where you can only do a pre and post processor rather than integrating it directly with OpenC. And tickle, you've learned all the commands today. So there's one more about arrays. If you can figure out how arrays work, it's really cool. There's also a linear algebra package for tickle. Oh yeah. Where you could do matrix manipulations. Oh cool. In that lab style. Uh, so I didn't write my own crossing dot products. Oh yeah, it has eigenvalues. <laughs> oh cool, SVDs yeah. And, all that. and the pull down menus. I mean the 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 TK interface is just so excellent. There's some Puji things about it. The dimensioning is just a little bit pain, but the canvas feature of TK and having pull down menus is. You know, these are all little pull down menus and call buttons, and every object in that figure, like you can assign a command to it. So it's a really nice. Um, I don't know Python, and I don't know how the graphics are of Python, um, but I'm really happy with what I can do with Tickle TK. So my recommendation is don't let it scare you. And honestly, with all the examples, if you go to examples manual, I did really highly detailed examples a long time ago to get you started with these things. Um, so I highly recommend investing the time in getting to know the language. If you want to put TK on top of it, you have to download the OpenSeas TK version, which is always available online. Questions? Yeah. Does it include the reliability analysis? No, not right now. It doesn't in there. So, so which um, version includes the uh, reliability analysis? Uh, the version that Frank is working on. The, the one that I have here doesn't, I don't even have the input for it, so I haven't developed the interface for it. It'd be great someday to be able to do that. Um, what you could do is you create this and you can, if you can then use as the essence of the interface and then put something, a layer on top for the reliability would be really, really cool. Um, you could probably do it well enough if you manage the scripting using the scripting input, because you could do all this with the graphic user, and user interface and then saves it and saves it to a building tickle script. And then you can modify and reprogram. Questions? Play with it. Not a perfect system. I'm the only one who's worked on it and I haven't had serious, I've, I've had a couple of graduate students here and there using it and testing it. Um, but I can use feedback on it, especially now that I'm getting back on it. <laughs> 
Where's Frank? Who's next? <laughs> he thought I was going to talk for an hour. That's all I have.